The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. We have some very upsetting news to start the show off. It's every parent's worst nightmare, right? There's a young man who's gone missing. We want to get the word out there. Uh, This is from the Los Angeles area. Sage Gertzwig is 25 years old and he has been missing for two nights. He went missing in the Burbank area. Um, he is 25 years old. You can see on the screen, he is six feet tall. He has dark black hair. When he went missing, he was wearing a blue cotton button down collar shirt with dark blue shorts and black sandals. He was last seen in Los Angeles at Western, uh, on exposition around 2 AM two nights ago. And he's trying to find his way back to North Hollywood. We want to make sure that if anybody has seen Sage also that notably his right hand index finger is in a splint, uh, or was when he went missing. His parents are asking for any help at all. If anybody has seen him or knows anything or suspects that they know anything, there is an officer who has been assigned to this case. Sage, by the way, is considered uh, developmentally disabled. Um, And so he is not okay to be out on his own. His parents say that he needs help and support. So officers Lawrence and Ferrari are available you can, if you have any information, please call 310-482-6334. And if you absolutely know anything, it's extension 2297. So that phone number is up on the screen, please. You know, all I can say is I think this is all of our worst nightmares, right? And what would you want someone to do for you if it were your kid that was missing? And then do that. If you're in the Los Angeles area and or you have friends in the Los Angeles area, share it on Facebook. Let's Facebook so that his face is seen by everyone and hopefully he can be found and safely returned. I, I think it's important to stay positive. It is just overwhelming to think of one of our young people out on the streets and, you know, overnight, it's just, like I said, it's unthinkable. I do want to say though, that we, we have experienced, um, a friend of the show where Mario Snow has gone missing twice now. And, um, the first time he was gone for 27 days, I don't know how his mother made it through it, but she found him on that 27th day. She found him on the 27th day. I think a lot of people had given up hope, but she found him and, you know, he's quite well and they take, he's someone who elopes when he sees violence or gets scared. He runs. It's what he does. In fact, he, he runs, he's done the Los Angeles marathon. And the last time that he went missing was at the end of the Los Angeles marathon. He had a partner running with him and, um, the partner got injured. Uh, Romario finished the, the run, but his mom couldn't get to the finish line to be with him. So he was waiting, but things got a little too hectic and he, he ran. And that time it took us two days to find him. So we don't give up hope. We stay positive. We learn as we go. And hopefully, you know, if you're a praying person, say a prayer for Sage and his family, that this has a happy outcome, right? Uh, Let's stay as positive as we can. All right. Uh, Please share. So also uh, we're welcoming you. We're live right now. It is the 11th of April, 2022. This is Autism A Month, right? April Autism Awareness Action Acceptance Allies. Let's come up with more A things. I don't think everybody's like, well, I think it's acceptance. I think it's that. Let's how it can be whatever you want it to be. And it doesn't even have to be A words as long as they're positive, right? That's how I feel about it. Let's, let's just all find a common ground to be on because every single person in this community comes 
with something different. We all have different roles to play. I want to be an ally because I'm a parent. My son was diagnosed with autism at the age of two and a half. You know, I refer to myself now as a pony, P-O-N-I, a, a parent of a neurodiverse individual. And I'm very happy to be a pony. Uh, it's like, I can be a pony. You can be a pony. We can all be a pony, right? Um, there were days when that would have seemed like the fur- furthest thing away for me. And I, I got incredibly lucky. We worked incredibly hard, but my son is doing really well and we're doing really well now. And I want to, I want to share that message with you, but help you to get there wherever you are in this community. So that starts, of course, with people who are on the spectrum, They are the beating heart of our community. Those neurodiverse individuals, we want to hear from them. We want to, we want to see them. We want to learn from them, right? We want to help support them. We want to help them to get to the things that they want to do that are important for them, right? Uh, But I also include, when we talk about the community, I include everyone who loves those individuals because together we are a big, beautiful community that doesn't agree on much of anything. Let's be honest about that. But Uh, there's one thing that we do agree on as far as I can see, and that is the dignity and rights of people who are on the autism spectrum, right? And um, their right to love who they want to love, live where they want to live, work, for heaven's sake, work, yes, um, and um, to be safe. I mean, look at Sage, to be safe, to have the supports that they need to do the things that are important to them. Uh, Simon says, hello, I'm watching from Buckinghamshire. I'm sure I didn't, very, very from the U.S. I'm sure that there are less uh, enunciated symbols and uh, syllables in there than than I know. uh, Buckinghamshire, maybe, I don't know. Tell us, uh, had reports age six, got my uh, official healthcare diagnosis age 28 years old. Simon, sending you a big hug. So glad that you're here with us. Because as I said, you're that beating heart of our community. And and we're here with other people who identify as being neurodiverse and with people who love people who are neurodiverse. This is a safe space in which we can talk about how can we get more done? How can we um, be of better support? How can we help other people to understand where we're coming from? right? And understand things that might help us. So hi, Simon. Uh, So thrilled that you are here with us. And see, that's how easy it is to write into the chat. We are right now live on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, and about a dozen other places. The fabulous Traven is showing you some of those places here. Want to remind you that we also, this is a podcast. This will podcast later on today and be available everywhere you get your podcasts for free. It's a free download. And we hope that you'll check us out. We don't... um, charge our viewers anything that has been, uh, we're, we're 10 years. We're starting our 11th year here. I, it was, it was, uh, yeah, 11th year here. Uh, but we, we have never charged our viewers. We do have expenses. We have to keep the lights on and we do that through views and through sponsorships. So we hope that you will, if you find something that you like here, we hope you will share it because that means more people see it. And that means that we've accomplished more of what we wanted to do, which was to help and to support. Right. But it also means that we can keep the lights on. So, uh, Oh, you're from the home of uh, Roald Dahl. Simon's from the home of Roald Dahl, we, which we all know. He wrote Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and James and the Giant Peach. My son's named James. Uh, Florine says hello from New York City. Hello. You know, I'm, I'm, I grew up in upstate New York and then lived in New York for a little while in a couple of different places. I love me some New York. Haven't been in a long time, but would love to. So Florine, so thrilled that you're there. I don't know if you know, Florine, that uh, Autism Live is on BronxNet TV. I believe, or is it Tuesday nights that we we air on BronxNet, uh, Traven? I don't know. Uh, but we are, it's the only place that we're on ca- cable. Parker, I'm so excited for you to see the new studio, but obviously we're not there. Uh, yeah, it's Tuesdays at 8.30 on BronxNet. Love that. Love that. If you would like for us to be live on your cable access, please uh, hook us up. Let us know who to talk to and we'll we'll make that happen. Yes, Parker, I'm, I'm so excited to show you the studio. Right now, it's a hot mess of wires. 
as you can only imagine, right? Traven has worked himself to the point of exhaustion, but it's a hot mess of wires. Amanda's here with her blue heart. So thrilled you guys are here. Uh, well, Parker, thank you for being happy uh, for us. We can't wait to take you on a virtual tour. I have a video of it like completely empty and then we should take a video now while we're in process and then you'll get to see when it's finally done. Oh, uh, Pharrell is looking forward to hearing from Thomas McKeon, who's going to be joining us in just a few minutes. You won't want to be too far away. Okay. So let's, let's, uh, and so that we can get to our guests, let's kind of move on with our, we like to start out on Mondays with our jargon of the day. This is when we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym. We try to figure out what in the hey, Nani Nani, are those experts talking about? And why can't they explain it to us in terms that we can all understand, right? Well, here's the thing about jargon. We use jargon as a, in the good sense, we use jargon as a way to get things done faster. So if we all understand and have come to an agreement that these are our jargon terms, then we're going to get things done faster, right? Like there's a whole set of jargon. I used to be a waitress. I waitressed my way through high school and, uh, and college and graduate school. And waitresses have jargon because it's just faster. You don't want to stand there and say a whole bunch, you know, uh, a bunch of things, you, you know, it's 86 on the, the baked potatoes. That means that we're all out of them. There's no more. You can't, I don't know why that's faster than saying we're all out of baked potatoes, but we all understand 86 baked potatoes, no more baked potatoes, right? Um, so it's supposed to be faster, but here's the other thing that happens with jargon is that it, forces people that if you aren't in the know, you aren't in the information track. And none of us can afford to not be in the information track, right? If there's things that can help us or people that we love, we want to know about it, right? So we take on the jargon here, one word, one phrase, one acronym at a time. We first give you the actual definition. We often make fun of the actual definition. Then we give you a working definition and we try to put it in a context so that we begin to see why would this even be worth my time to know what this thing is. Is, right? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. So today's jargon term is visual supports. Uh, this is something uh, we've never done this jargon term before because it's one of those things that it comes up a lot. And I think a lot of people just assume that we all know what we're talking about, but I like to shed a little spotlight from time to time because maybe there are parts of this that we're not thinking of in, in all the flexibility of all the way that we could. So let's, let's go first to our visual supports, um, actual definition. And let's see what it says. Visual supports is pictures or other visual items used to communicate with individuals who the understanding or using language. So there's a lot there. This is not one we're going to make fun of. It's not crazily out of reach, but I, I wanted to put it here because I, I love that it it's very vague, right? So it's pictures or other things because it could be a three-dimensional thing, right? It could be text. And we use it to communicate to individuals who maybe are having difficulty understanding or maybe are having difficulty using language. So we have both the receptive and the expressive here. And I want to make sure that we talk about this in the broad enough terms that we all use visual supports. There is not a one of us here that is not using visual supports of some kind. And you might be thinking to yourself, no, wait a second, Shannon, there might be folks on here who are visually impaired or even blind. Are they using visual supports? Well, we would include Braille as a visual support. Um, as, as something that is able, you know, that that's in a place that we can get some information from, or for some people who are visually impaired, who have the ability to see some things, we might use large text, right? Let's go ahead and move on to our working definition. Cause let's really hone this sucker down because I'll tell you something. The reason why we all use visual supports is because they're great. So visual supports are signs, pictures, objects, or text used to help anyone understand information. Anyone understand information. So think about when you're driving in your local burg where you are, 
There are street signs. What are they? Those are visual supports. And over the years, our street signs have gotten less textual and more into pictures. I love when you're looking at a, a, a shirt that you want to put into the washer and you now look at the tag and it's got all those little symbols. Those are all visual supports to tell you how to wash it, how to dry it, how to iron it. Now, you've got to have a flow chart, an infograph, which is also a visual support to translate for you what all those little symbols mean. But we, my point here is we all use these. In fact, we all lean heavily into visual supports on a regular basis. And not everyone is really responsive to visual, but a lot of people are, and a lot of folks on the autism spectrum are. I'm a visual person. Temple Grandin is a visual person, right? Temple and I are vastly different, but we're both very visual people. So if you're trying to explain something to me, let's say that you're going to teach me something and, you know, it's got this big old concept and it's a big old idea. At some point I need to see it on a, I, or I need to draw it myself and go, so is it this? Is it that? You know, I, I got to make myself some sort of a picture so that I understand the whole thing. I've been to Disneyland, right? And, and I can't get a grip on it unless I have that map and I can see on the map. Oh, okay. Um, so we're here and we want to get here. Uh, then I have a better understanding of where we're going and how we're doing. It's, it's interesting because my son is just starting to drive now and he's been living here in Los Angeles forever and he has no concept of where things are in relation to each other. And I never really thought about it. I should have been having him have a map on a regular basis so that it wouldn't be this big shock as he learns how to drive. But visual supports are so crucial and if we're thinking about teaching anyone something, or let's say that we love someone on the spectrum or not, and they're having difficulty with something, one of the first things I like to ask myself is, would a visual support help here? Would it help if there was a, a picture next to the sink that said, wash your hands before leaving? Mm, is that why every single restaurant has that in its restrooms to remind its employees to wash their hands before leaving? You see what I'm saying here? We all lean heavily into this. And yet sometimes when we're at home, we forget that this is available to us for ourselves and for the people that we love. Um, Amanda says, I recently made a wiping visual support with pictures and the poop fades less and less on the toilet paper. I love that, Amanda. That's wonderful. Um, absolutely wonderful. Now, Simon wrote in before when I was talking about jargon, getting things done faster. Is that an response for autistic people? No, I don't, I don't think it's uh, at all. Simon, um, I, I think that it's, I think it's the messed up way our society works now that there's so much thrown at all of us that, um, and I think that these factions of people decide to, to make it easier for themselves and lose the rest of us down because, you know, maybe the doctor can say to the nurse, oh, this, that, and whatever. But if I need to understand what they're doing, the jargon actually literally slows things down. It grinds it right down to a halt. Um, and that's why we take on jargon of the day to try to slow it down, try to understand the term and understand why it might be helpful to us. So I'm a former, no, thank you, Simon, um, for asking the question, because sometimes I get too far going do, 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 and forgetting uh, the questions. But um, I, I'm a former classroom teacher. And I can tell you that the thing that jazzed me about teaching was when you would identify that, okay, somebody needs to learn something here, right? Other than the, the curriculum, which is always set and wonderful. And, you know, that's great. But maybe somebody is missing something to be able to really access the curriculum. And then as a teacher, it was always exciting to me to figure out, okay, how can we teach this? How can we get in there? And because I would see that when you could get in and teach that individual something, boy, they'd fly. Then suddenly they would get everything and then they'd be teaching me, right? Forgive my dog. Um, 
So that would be the most exciting thing to me as a teacher. And then, so when that happens and you're like, okay, our, we've identified an issue. I won't even say a problem or a challenge, an issue, something that somebody needs to learn. It might be me. How, how can we help me to learn it easier? Cause we don't want to make learning Oh, internet. First the dog, then the internet. Uh, hopefully you guys have me back. Internet having troubles. Uh, first the dog, then the internet. Anyway, uh, so how how can we make things easier for the person? And that's why we put in supports. A visual support is just one of the things that we can do. It's just, it tends to be wildly effective. That's why as a society, we lean into it uh, and use it a lot. Uh, Faria wants to know, could you please tell about autism private school? You know, um, what I guess I want to ask you is where do you live? Because it's not an, a level playing field. I'm here in Los Angeles and we have several very good private schools, um, for individuals who are on the autism spectrum. Each one of them is vastly different. And if you came to me and said, which one should my child go to? I wouldn't have any idea which one to tell you because I would want to know, you know, what, what age, what, you know, challenges they were having, like, um, you know, is it the social thing that's more in the way? Are they behind academically? There would be so many things to talk about because it should, it, Education should be individualized for everyone. It's not. But when when we have someone who's on the spectrum, they're eligible for an IEP so that it can be individualized for them. Then we have to talk about what is the setting and can, can we do enough support within a setting for them to be in the general education? Uh, or do we have to take them outside because there's too much sensory going on? Um, okay. So you said, uh, I don't know that Academy. Where is that? Can you tell me a, uh, a city? Uh, okay. Uh, but in any case, uh, Traven is telling me I got right in and tell me more for Rhea and then, but we need to get to the question of the day. So let's move on to the question of the day and we will get back to this. Hi, Mohib. So thrilled that you're here. Uh, so our question today, and by the way, you guys can be writing in to us, uh, Queens. Okay. We'll take a look at that. So how do visual supports help you? I want you guys to, if you have a second, write in and tell us how visual supports help you. So Faria, I now know that you're in Queens and that there are sensory issues. So what I'm going to do is ask you to email me and then, um, I'll, I'll be able to connect you to some people who might be able to make, make some suggestions for you. So my email is Shannon at autism hyphen live.com. Cause that's going to get real specific. Um, but write into us and then we'll, we'll, We'll see if we can't help you find that. So how do you guys uh, use visual supports to help you? Can I tell you that for the last 15 years, I have a thing that goes on the mirror in my bathroom that reminds me to breathe, that reminds me that I can be present today, that today is a, a day where I can make choices that are for good or that I could choose to be stressed out. But why would I choose that, right? <laughs> And that helps me. That really, really does. All right, moving on to our topic of the day, because we're already late to have Thomas in here. Hearing with all of our senses. This is something that is so important to me right now, and I hope is important to you guys, that there's lots of ways to hear what someone is saying. We've talked before on the show about, we tend to have this belief that most communication is vocal. It's a lie. It really is not true. They've done studies on this and what we take in from vocal communication accounts for somewhere between 13 and 20% of what we understand in the world. Think about that for a second. That means that 80% or more of the information that we take in is not from someone yakking at us. We take information in visually, we hear things, we notice little things, facial expressions, we notice signs, we notice text, we notice all those different things. And when we can key into our environment, we can learn a great deal more 
when we can help someone else key into their environment, we can learn more. But here's the biggest thing. If we truly want to be good allies, then we need to hear with all of our senses. So if you, for instance, have a teenager who's on the autism spectrum, and and it's really important to you that they brush their teeth. I'm just using these as an example. Um, and, and, and we yak at them and go, brush your teeth, brush your teeth, brush your teeth. Or, or we stand over them and we, you know, we're, we're doing all of these things, offering them rewards for brushing their teeth or, you know, hopefully not punishing them for not brushing their teeth. Right. Cause that hasn't been shown to be effective, but we're doing all of these things, but when it's not working, whatever it is, whether it's, you know, toothbrushing with a 14 year old or, um, getting a a two-year-old to be, you know, safe and not walk away from you, right? Whatever it is, if we can stop for a second and hear with all of our senses, if we look to see what's the body language, what, what is my child trying to tell me? What is my friend trying to tell me? What's my significant other trying to tell me? What is happening? Uh, what do I see? What do I hear? What do I feel? How does it feel? Because sometimes there's something going on and we know it. We get that little tickle sense that goes, "Mm, something's going on with them. And we can't really put our finger on even which one of the senses is telling us that. But that tickle is there. That intuition is there. And I think we're at our best when we listen to that, when we listen with all of our senses. So that's what we're going to be talking about, that this is one of the ways that we can be the best possible um, yeah. And Jacob says, now we got to see your dog. LOL. My dog is so something else. Uh, Amanda says my to-do list remember, uh, helps me remember what I need to do. That's a visual support. Absolutely. And Renee and Elvira, good morning and hugs Shannon. Oh, uh, they said, uh, you're definitely my, uh, my favorite educator. Oh, that's so sweet. Uh, I always said I wanted to be a teacher when I grew up and I got to be one. And then I, I left teaching when, after my son was diagnosed and I, I, I totally miss it. So sometimes I go into teacher mode here. Um, and Florine says, why does my 13 year old grandson say he always forgets? I would need to know more, Florine, write me more and say what the, what happens before and then what happens as a result of him saying he forgets? Write in and tell us more. I got to get to our guest, though, because we had him on the show, I don't know, it was like a month and a half ago, Thomas McKean, uh, a fabulous, fabulous gentleman who's really been a mover and shaker in the autism community. Um, really, the author, I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about his book and, and how it really changed a lot of how the autism community was seen. We invited him on last time to talk about individuality and identity. And we, we, there was so much going on. We didn't get very far. And of course I jumped in and asked questions and I talked too much. So I'm going to talk less this time, but I'm going to welcome back Thomas McKean and um, Thomas, how are you today? Uh, Oh, Oh, there I am. There you are. Welcome back to autism live. Uh, can, can you hear me? Am I here? Yes, I, we can hear you. You're here. Um, and I can, I can go through your bio, but I wanted to leave you more time to talk. Um, should we, t- should I say a little bit of the stuff in the bio or do you want to uh, tell us? Uh, go ahead. I'm, I'm looking at these big ears. I have, uh, I was going to wear these, but, uh, the, the battery forgot to charge them. So I, Oh, big ears I on. think they look cool. I, you know, the, the kids all think the earphones are, are happy. Very retro in uh, a way. So you're good. But uh, you guys need to know that Thomas uh, was diagnosed in 1979 at the age of 14. And he did three years in an institution uh, because of autism. And uh, he was eventually... Uh, once he got himself out of that institution, ran for and was elected to the National Board of Directors for the Autism Society of America. And at that time, they were the world's largest autism advocacy organization. He served two non-consecutive terms 
and uh, a la Grover Cleveland. I like that, Thomas. From 1992 to 1994 and 97 to 2000, he's a speaker, a keynote speaker at various autism conferences around North America, uh, both on his own and alongside Temple Grandin and other notable advocates. And he's also uh, someone who does regular consulting for families and school systems throughout the USA and Canada. And uh, he was one of the people that was part of creating the original puzzle piece, which I know you take a, you take a, a lot of guff about, Thomas. Maybe we need to talk about that. Uh, he's actually written two books. I was going to let you talk about those, though, because uh, I want to hear more from you and not from me. Uh, so talk to us, Thomas. We're so thrilled and honored that you're back. Look with us. At, uh, what's her What's her face, Florine? Do I have that right? Uh, the one that was asking about why her 13 year old grandson always forgets. He told her to write more, and she says, "Asking him to put deodorant on in the morning." Yeah. Uh, Do you want to answer that? Um, that That's kind of given me flashbacks to a couple of conversations Temple and I have had. Uh, one of them, of course, is her classic story. I'm sure you've heard it about how she was going to work and uh, the boss uh, kind of gave her a talking to because she didn't have the deodorant on. I'm sure you've heard that story. Yes. And uh, she gave me a talking to one day. The first time I heard that story, uh, I was we were we were at a, a conference speaking together. I think it might have been one of those dog and pony show future horizon conferences we did back in the day. And I love those, by the way. Re you remember them? The ones with me I, and Temple and uh, I Carol? Love and those. I love a good future horizon conference. Absolutely love them. Um, but uh, did she, she said something to you about how yeah, you smell? Because uh, just like uh, I'm looking at it here. Uh, oh, her grandson, it says, uh, says he forgot that particular day. I forgot to shave. This is my favorite Temple Grandin story. I've got a bunch of them, but this one is my favorite. So I'll start the 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 uh, the event here by telling you my favorite Temple Grandin story. Okay. And I I uh, for whatever reason I guess I was in a hurry or whatever. I kind of you know forgot to shave and. I was in the hallway and I was walking one way. Temple was just walking the other. It was just a coincidence. We happened to pass each other. And as, as we got close, Temple stopped me. And she said in that Temple Grandin voice, you look like a complete slob. <laughs> and how did that make you feel? I didn't get it at first. Because I didn't really understand where she was. I like, do I have something on my shirt? Do I? What happened? And then she told me. She told me that I didn't shave, and she told me the story about you know the the deodorant. And by that time, you know, um, you know, the conference had started, and I was going to be on, and it was too late. So I had to do the talk without shaving. But uh, Temple was not pleased with me. I'm I'm pretty sure she would remember that. She was. She was not happy with me that day. And did that resonate, though, with you, Thomas? For her, when the teacher called her out and said, you know, you can't come in here smelling bad, that changed for her. And then she's been very, very specific about making sure that she looks presentable and smells presentable. Did it change for you as a result of her saying something? Um, you know, I guess it I guess it did. Um, I, there have still been times that I presented that uh, I have uh, I haven't, but I I think that I do you know you know shave uh, more often now because of because of that comment that she made to me. It's 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 just kind of, and I'm sure every guy can relate to this. It's just not something that I enjoy doing. Yeah, well, I think it goes back to the whole thing about you know, we only do things if we get something out of it. And well, it's like you know, the carrot of the I'm stick, gonna right? There, I'm going to be up there talking to people on the stage. It's going to be to my benefit to look presentable. Right. So I would get something out of it in that situation. And in that sense, she was right. And so are you. Well, but 
But I think sometimes in as we go through life, there are some things that everything can't occur to us all the time. Um, but I find it interesting that when, you know, if somebody says something to you and it suddenly matters to you, I think that's when behavior change happens. Not necessarily because the person said something. I think it has to be the double thing of someone brought it up and it matters to you. Do you agree, Thomas? I mean, I, it, might also, it might also be also who brings it up. I mean, you know, Temple and I don't agree on everything, but I do have a great respect for her. And, yeah. you know, that might have been part of it too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I know for my son, when he was a teenager, there were aspects of the self-care thing that, you know, it just wasn't on his radar. And it, and it wasn't until a girl um, said something to him, and it wasn't a girl that he p- was particularly interested in, but it was just a girl who was looking at, because his guy friends weren't going to say these things to him, right? But a girl said something, and then all of a sudden, he realized that other people were looking at him and thinking things. And uh, then then he wanted to take better care of himself but uh, to answer that question because i understand i am supposed to be interactive today to answer that question off to the side uh jacob i think uh the institution was for the uh mentally disabled which i think autism qualifies more as a neurological disorder but they were still putting them in those places back then uh he's talking about how uh, they were back in the 50s and they closed down back in the 80s for abuse allegations. Uh, This one was in the 80s. It was in the 80s I was there and uh, it has since closed down. I've I've been back on the grounds once since then. Um, Mm -hmm. It was in the 80s. It was, I think, uh, 80 to 83, I think. And yes, like those others, it, it has closed down. So I hope that answers his question. Absolutely. Although we want to say that there are still some pretty terrifying places that are still open, like the Judge Rottenberg Center. My God, what is it we have to do to get that place to close? Uh, just horrible. Um, but in any case, Thomas. The AFA has had dealings with the Judge Rottenberg Center. I'm sorry, what did you say? The ASA has had uh, situations with them. Back when they were uh, BRI, what was it, Behavior Research Institute or something like that? Before it was the Judge Rottenberg Center, but it was the same place. They were... uh, they were they were in the exhibit hall at a conference. Did we talk about this last time? I think I don't either. remember. It makes my blood boil, so I don't remember well, that. They had this. Uh, they they were in the exhibit hall, and they had this booth. This was at ASA National in ninety two, ninety three, something like that. It was back. It was a long time ago, and they had out on the table. They had like these. Um, how can I put this politely? Accoutrements, let's say. And I picked up and I held in my own little hands this little device that is designed to squirt lemon juice into your eyes if you're bad. And I, that was, I just, I picked this up and I looked at it and I thought, why am I even holding this thing? And I put it back How down. horrifying. That has to have made you sick to your stomach, Thomas. I, I just, oh, I can't even. Oh, and the fact I, that that place is still alive and doing business makes me full on nuts every day. Well, yeah, ASA caught a lot of flack for um, Good. allowing them in. And there was uh, a lot of discussion about it in the boardroom after that conference. And they were they were banned. We banned them from the conference. And as um, far as I know... Um, at least during my five years with ASA, those are the only people that we ever banned from the conference. Yeah, but but they deserved it. So good on you guys for doing that. Thomas, I want you to have time to talk about what you want to talk about today. So what's the first thing you want to talk about? Um, well, let's talk about Autism Awareness Month. You mentioned that. They, they kind of go together, the two things that I want to talk about. They kind of I, I wrote a little note here. You were talking earlier. I made a note. Um, oh, there it is. Here it is. A little quote you said. Uh, Autism Awareness Month can be whatever you want it to be. I kind of agree with that. And, uh, you know, 
a little while ago, a few years ago, I think I had a problem with people calling it, um, you know, Autism Acceptance Month or Autism Action Month or Autism Advocacy Month, I've heard. And uh, because when we put that together, uh, we made it Autism Awareness Month for a reason, and that was because we wanted to to promote awareness of of autism, which is and the reason that we picked April, uh, if it's not obvious, we had I don't know like maybe twelve choices I think, and uh, we narrowed it down to two April and August because they both start with A like like autism, and uh, from there we it was easy to choose April because it was springtime, new beginnings, and a better time for uh, conferences and events and fundraisers. And that's why uh, it's in April. So a little uh, a little Autism Awareness Month trivia for you guys out there. But uh, over the past couple of years, I've really kind of mellowed on that. And I've kind of come to understand that it's not it's not what you call it. You can, like you said, call it whatever. It's really kind of more the spirit behind it. And I, I didn't think it was going to go anywhere when we when we made it because the incidence was a lot lower than it was like one in something thousand. I think it's one in forty four now, isn't it? I, it was one in something thousand then, and I didn't think it was going to go anywhere. And I've over the years, I've just watched it take off, and I've been kind of amazed by that, and 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 seeing what people have done with it, and the money that they raise, and the awareness that they raise, and the events that they have. I think it's really cool what people have done with it over the years. My internet cut out for a second, Thomas, so I missed part of what you said. I apologize. Um, but yes, you are right that it's one in one in forty four. Uh, one in 43, I think, boys. Um, Kathy has written in, and I'm trying to answer you, Kathy, and my internet went crazy. And uh, Pharrell wants to know if uh, if you would answer Florine's question. But I feel like you already did. But let's well, ask. Well, I didn't really answer it. And it's uh, Farrell Brody. Hello, Farrell. Uh, good to see you. Farrell requested the link to this. He wanted to, to be on, so I sent it to him. Um, the, the, I, I think he's asking about, um, is it, is it the question about why her grandson forgets or we back? Yeah, I, I, but, there, but he wants to know what you would do. What would you do about it? Oh, what would I do if he forgot? Uh, you were talking about visual supports earlier. That's a good as answer as any, you know, if you see something that helps you remember. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, can, you can try that. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, that's that's kind of a, a, a common thing that parents do. You know and how the they have the little boards and they have the little pictures that give you the little step by step that tell tell their kids how to do something. Um, there's a name, a clinical name for that. I don't remember what it is, but uh, apparently it's very effective. Yeah. And, and, you know, you might want to play around with where you and what visual support, like some people, it would just be text on the, on the bathroom mirror. Don't forget to put deodorant on for another person. It might be a, a cartoon drawing of their arm deodorant going on. Uh, it could be at the front door that there's a picture of the deodorant. I mean, think about all the different places, all the different ways that you could um, have that. Now, Kathy has written in and said that not only will her son not cut his uh, hair, that his hair is a bush, he won't get a haircut, but she also wants to know if anybody has had um, their teen evaluated for driving ability. And my internet went nuts, but I was trying to write back to you, uh, Kathy, and ask uh, a question if your, if your son is riding a bicycle. That's my question. But Thomas, do you want to talk about haircuts or the bicycle? Um, or not the bicycle, the driving. I could sort of relate to the haircuts. I mean, I got over it at some point, but I, I guess maybe I haven't. I still don't like getting my haircut, and I usually wait until it's so in my eyes. Farrell, who is on here, he can tell you he's seen me with the long hair. 
uh, I usually wait until I, it's just so annoying in my eyes the last minute to get it cut because I just it, it's not something that I like. It's it's a uh, and I've talked about this at, at conferences before because it's a common question that that you get there. You know, my kid doesn't like to get his hair cut. What can I do? And it's 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 kind of a physically painful kind of thing. And um, and you know, sometimes the the smarter, more knowledgeable people say, "Well, how can that be? Because hair is dead cells, and you wouldn't feel it." And they're right about that. And I've wondered about that over the years. I have a theory, can't prove it. It's just a thought that maybe, and this is just a wild guess, maybe someone who knows more, if they're watching about neurology and the way things work and say, you know, maybe he's right or this guy's absolutely nuts or something. I'm wondering if it might be the vibration from the scissors cutting the hair, going down the hair and getting into your scalp. Yeah, I, I think that's very plausible. Plus, which, you know, I'm somebody who had very curly hair all throughout my life. And, and you know, it, we could say that it doesn't actually hurt the ends of the hair. But I don't know about you, Thomas, whenever they were cutting my hair, they were pulling on it. And my scalp would hurt. So, well, there is that too. Yes, there is that too. And um, there are uh, there are some people that are, are better about that than others. And there are um, there's there's this one place, um, it used to be called the Puzzle Piece Salon until she took too much heat for it, and then she changed it. Are you familiar with this? I can't remember it's located. I think it's a parent, I think it's a parent who, um, who understood that, that her, her child was having problems, and she kind of opened up this, 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 uh, salon, this hair place, and she kind of caters to to people with autism specifically, and kind of uh, modifies the haircut, if you will, to make it a little yeah. less dramatic. There's a lot of sensory barbers now. Um, there, it, there was Jim the barber over in England that started a whole movement of training barbers to be more sensory sensitive. So it is the kind of thing that you can kind of look up. And, and Kathy does say his hair is curly. Um, so, I, you know, I'm always someone, Thomas, that I'm like, pick your battles. As long as they keep it clean and they can see, I, you know, I know it's, it's hard sometimes because we have an idea in our head of what we want our kids to look like, but you know, it's not necessarily who they want to look like or how they feel comfortable. Um, I'm somebody who cannot, I, I keep, I cut my own hair at this point because I can't stand to have my hair long. Other people can't stand to have it short. I think it's a pretty personal thing, but if there are other guidelines, like keeping it, um, so that you can see and clean, what do you think about that, Thomas? Let him, let him have it a little longer. What do you think? I think, I think you're absolutely right about that. Pick your battles. I mean, that's, those are like three of the top words in all of autism is pick your battles. And, it, and they always have been. My hair, I think, is a little too short. Uh, I, I went to get it cut and because um, I was doing a, a song at the, at the, at the church, a, a Unitarian church. I went to get my hair cut for that. And uh, the place that I usually go to is close. So I went somewhere else and there was this lady that I'd never seen before. And she said, well, do you just want to trim? And I said, yes. And she cut it. It hasn't been this short in over 40 years. Wow. Uh, but people are telling me they like it. So I, I don't know. Maybe that. short is in now. And, and Kathy was saying she was just curious. But I think a lot of folks on the spectrum, that getting their hair cut is not the favorite thing. Wouldn't you say that? Thomas? Uh, the, the, that matches my experience, yes. Um, I, I, it doesn't apply to everyone, but there are several out there who, uh, who, who don't really fancy getting a haircut. And as to, the, as to the driving, Thomas, do you drive? Have you ever been a driver? I do. Uh, I was a little late. What I remember is getting a license at 18, not 16, like everyone else in Ohio, here where I am. So I was a couple of years late and, um, you know, I've been in an accident or two. Not all of them were my fault. Um, 
one guy uh, pushed me off the road on uh, Interstate 71, and I hit the median, and the car rolled over down the freeway. Um, but as you can see, I survived that. Um, uh, I'm not really, uh, I'm not really sure um, what to, what to say about that. Um, I uh, one thing that comes to mind is the the senses of of uh, people with autism are not really designed to to be able to process rapid information, and I think that can be a problem with driving because. You know, you have to kind of you're, you you got the wheel and you kind of got to pay attention. You got to look around and you have to listen. And there's cars going by you at these fast speeds, and sometimes the sirens coming at you from you don't know where. So you really have to to uh, be able to compensate for that if you want to be a good driver. I think, and there are some who can. Yeah, I haven't been but- in or a ticket in years. But there, but there are a lot of people who either don't feel that they're up to driving or that their family doesn't think that they're up to driving or they just choose not to. And this is both on the spectrum and not on the spectrum. And Jacob asked the question, is it okay not to have a license or to be able to drive? In today's society, I think it's totally acceptable. What do you think, Thomas? I, I think um, in any society, it should be. I mean, that... that that I think should be a personal choice, kind of like the hair we were talking about earlier. Yeah. And especially if they're doing it for safety reasons, then how can you not be in favor of it? So uh, if someone is out there saying, you know, I just would rather not, or I don't think it would be okay for me to do this, I think it's it's a good thing to honor that. Yeah. I think that going back to the listening with all your senses, I think we need to hear that and go, it's okay. I do want to say though, that in terms of evaluating whether somebody is ready to drive or able to drive, the state of Louisiana has technology that they were doing research on that was, um, I don't know if the research is done at this point, but there there was a driving simulator that was uh, designed specifically to evaluate whether someone had the capability to process the information to be a good driver. Um, I haven't seen that be any place else but Louisiana. But one of the things that I've heard experts talk about here is that you know, if your child is able to successfully ride a bicycle with no training wheels, that um, and to manage riding a bicycle out in public, that then then you can start having the conversation. But if they're not able to do that, then you should do that first uh, before you even start talking. Apparently, there's a lot of people that the kids weren't able to successfully ride a bike, but jumped ahead to vehicles. And I've not heard that going well. So uh, uh, the one thought that occurs to me with that, though, and this is the complexity of autism, because nothing in autism is ever easy. Yeah. One thought that, that occurs to me, and I might, no, I don't think I'm wrong about this. Um, one thought that occurs to me is uh, vestibular dysfunction. And to ride a bike, you have to be able to balance on the two wheels. You were just saying just a minute ago about the training wheels. I'm not sure that applies to driving the car because when you're driving the car, you're sitting down, you're on four wheels, there's no balance required. You're so sure that, right. the reason they might not be able to ride the bike might not be information processing that might be vestibular processing. So if change that criteria then to need to be able to successfully ride a bike with or without training wheels, would you feel better about that? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I might. It's hard um, to have a, a be all end all because everybody's different. Well, it is. I, it's, it's hard for me to picture, um, someone driving, you know, riding the bike along the street at any kind of regular bike riding speed with training wheels on. There are, there are bikes now that are bigger bikes that they're, they're, they're big tricycles um, that I've seen that, um, yeah, that are, that are kind of cool. But in any case, uh, 
uh, I want I want to get back, Thomas, to the things that you wanted to talk about because we're already running out of time. Uh, so, in terms of this this month, did you have more that you wanted to say about autism and what what we're calling? There is it? one other thing I wanted to say. You're looking at it on your list, I'm sure. Um, I wanted to talk about this um, thing happening in the autism community, speaking for others. Um, I can't, I, I have a problem with this. And uh, the reason for that being is, you know, I can't speak for Shannon. I can't tell people, you know, Shannon's in favor of this or Shannon's against that, or this is what Shannon thinks about this, or this is what Shannon feels about that, because I don't know. To my knowledge, we've never actually met in person. I don't think we have. No. Um, I met so many. We may have. I don't remember. No, them. we haven't met in person. Only okay, good. Only I wouldn't really upset you by forgetting. No, 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 no. But no, no. Um, you know, we. But but I don't know you. And there's there's people who are speaking for. You know the autism community out there saying, you know, this is what the majority of autism think and feel, and it's never anything positive, as you know. It's always something negative. It's not what people with autism, you know, feel good about or or who or what they love or care about. It's always something negative, what they don't like, what they hate, what they would rather not see. And it's always coincidentally what that particular individual feels. My understanding is that the current estimate is that there's about 70 million people with autism if you consider all of us everywhere, which means that for them to say that they would have to know for sure how how over 35 million of them feel about something. And on top of that, um, I just heard, I think it was just yesterday or the day before, someone was telling me that when the CDC updated the numbers to the one in 44, this part I didn't know, apparently they're saying that now 40% um, also have some kind of uh, intellectual disability. I think that number might be a little high. I think it might be a little lower, maybe not by much. But, you know, those are the ones who who may not even be able to tell us what they think or feel about, about anything, or even if they care one way or the other about any particular topic. So what I'm what I'm trying to tell your 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 viewers and your listeners here is um, because of that. Uh, oh, and also uh, add this to it: um, if you're going to speak for someone else, you 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 kind of need authority to do that. You know, if you if you share and say, okay, you're going here, you can tell somebody that I said this then yes, I can do that. But um, none of us want people speaking for us and saying things for us that are not true and things that we don't feel and don't believe. And um, it's, it's very rare to, to get the authority to speak for the autism community. Very few people have had it. I am one of them, but it has long since expired. And I speak only for myself now because I know not to speak for others because I don't want others speaking for me. So what I'm saying here, long-winded as I'm being, I'm really trying to be as nice as I can about this, is the people who are telling you the majority of um, the people with autism feel this way or that way, uh, no, they don't know. They're just kind of saying it and it's something that's happening this month all over social yeah. media and it's it's bugging me and it's bugging others and you know it's going back to the the attacks and the bullying that all of us have seen and aren't happy with it's really hard topic i gotta say all the way around you know i think as much as we don't know each other well thomas i i read what you write and you've heard a little bit about what i have to say here and i you know, I always say I want to listen to folks who are on the spectrum. 
I just want to listen. I want to be a student in the front row. But there are times. You said that a few minutes ago when you started. Yeah. I I always want to listen. But there are times when I will be someplace, whether it's at a conference or here, and um, and while I'm listening, I, you know, I have an agreement with my son. We talk about what I'm allowed to say and what I'm not allowed to say um, on a daily basis uh, because it's not okay for me to be here and talk about him without that conversation. Um, and I ask him on a daily basis, what words do you want me to use when I'm talking about you in relation to autism, right? And my son is, so he's 18 and he's part of a generation. There was a generation before him of people who referred to themselves as autistic. Um, My son, my son never did. In fact, when he was very young, a a reporter who was interviewing him referred to him as autistic. And he, he said, I, I am not autistic. I have autism. Those have been his words. I didn't give them to him. Those are his words. Um, but I'll be someplace and I'll say something about uh, my my son. You know, I used to say, you know, that he had autism and and people would interrupt me and say, that's inappropriate. You shouldn't say that he's autistic. And then I would be in that space where I would have to say, I'm sorry, I will refer to you that way. But this is at my son's request. And then they tell me, well, that's not valid. That You're right. I'm a- Right. And right. then I, and go, if, I go, oh, I don't know what to do now. <laughs> right. And if if there is someone, any individual person who has a preference one way or the other, yes, you honor that. Yeah. You you absolutely do honor which way they they would they would personally like to be referred to because they can do that for themselves. Yes. But as you just as you just mentioned, here was someone trying to do it for someone else and they were wrong about that. Yeah. Um, back in back in the early '90s, I think it was around the same time we had that incident with the Judge Rottenberg Center. Um, this whole political correctness thing happened, and there was talk in the ASA boardroom. You know, how do we how do we do this? How do we how do we refer to you? Do we refer to 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 them as autistics or? or people with autism. And I think there was like over an hour's discussion about that. Um, they asked me about it. And at the time uh, I said, I said autistic. I, my, my thoughts on that have changed since then to the point that it really doesn't make that much of a difference to me. And in the end though, and I think this even went up for a vote they decided on person with autism, their motivation for doing that was they were they were by saying a person with autism you know trying to convey that you know respect to the person and say you know we see you as a as an individual as a person not as not as a condition that you may have and they they were thinking that if they they referred to someone as autistic that it would, in a sense, be an identity. And at that time, it was absolutely, utterly, completely, totally inconceivable that anyone would want that as an identity. Times have changed. But back then, it was it was thought to be um, very inconsiderate and disrespectful um, to, to think of a person as as their their um, any kind of disability or, or or disorder or condition first before before the person. If I'm making sense, I hope so. So no, because you're totally of that, sense. yeah, because of that, and it went up for a vote, and I voted in favor of it because I understood where they were coming from. Because of that, they decided to go with person with autism, and um, I don't know if that's changed, but I know that at least for a time. With ASA, that was a that was a policy person first because because you are a person first. Yes, but there is a whole group of, of individuals who say that to do that means that you're saying you're ashamed of who you are, and that that's why they are saying please refer to me as autistic. And I believe in you. Tell me like what words to use to describe you. 
and I need to honor those. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about autism or we're talking about gender or whatever. You tell me how how you want yourself referred to. And and I ask people all the time, how would you like, what words would you like me to use to describe you? And they'll say, I'm a person. I'm You're a right. person. You're right. right. And, and, and nowadays, I kind of like that. <laughs> nowadays, people are even asking about pronouns, which was also completely inconceivable back then. Yeah. It just didn't happen. Yeah. You know, exactly. if you remember the early 90s, there, there was, that just wasn't there. Oh, and, not at all. Um, but, and, and I understand, I, they think I don't understand where they're coming from with this and, and the identity and wanting to be proud of who they are. I do get where they're coming from with it. What I don't get is, is the, the, uh, the bullying and, and the, um, the attacks and the making demands. I just kind of think that's the wrong way to go about getting what you want. Understand that that what we were doing with ASA is we were saying person with autism not um, as any kind of disrespectful way, but just the opposite. When we put the puzzle piece together, we did that not as a, uh, and I think we did talk about this last time, not as anything disrespectful, but the opposite. It was, we did it as, as respect. I think that was the third generation, the third um, iteration of the puzzle piece. And the previous two were one piece. You may remember them. They had the crying child inside them. And we did away with that. We did away with that because by that time we had learned more and we understood more about what autism was and we no longer felt it was appropriate. And we wanted to be respectful to the autism population. And one of the ways we did that was to remove the, the crying child and replace it with, with, you know, symbolism that we felt was more appropriate. Yeah. It's so hard because when we're talking about a community as large and diverse as, as the autism, those on the spectrum and the people who love them, right? Like, right. I, I feel like there's there's like the community of people who are on the spectrum and that's the main community. But then there's a bigger community of people around them who love them. And I group them all together in a, in a separate community I call the bigger autism community. Because I think that if we if we all could get to the place where we respect each other's differences... Who? What could we teach the rest of the world, right? right? And there was a time. There was a time when we were there, or very close to there, and then now, now we're not. It's kind of moved. It's it's like there's this this war between. between yeah, I don't think I was here when we were all people the who thing. love them, and that's just that's just not right. We should be no. working together. And, you know, all throughout this month, as I've had guests on and I've said, what do you, you know, what do you think the biggest issue in the autism community is? This is what everybody says, that there is division within that isn't, that isn't productive. And that when you whittle it all down, it all comes down to understanding and respecting individuals, right? That on both sides, everybody and respecting needs- respecting their choices. Yeah, yeah. And the way they language themselves and, you know, and that that it's called a spectrum. And then if we could get to the point where we all honored that the fact that it is a spectrum and that, you know, who you are on this spectrum is different than anyone else on this spectrum. And that if we could get to the point where we just valued that and didn't question it, didn't try to minimize it, diminish it or bully it into being something else on the spectrum I think we would be able to change the world. I totally agree with that. <laughs> and, uh, and Amanda, How do we get there, Thomas? <laughs> I, um, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, don't I don't know. know. You know, I, I think a couple of years, maybe three or four years ago, I might have had some ideas because we were a lot closer. Yeah. But we're so far away from it now that I don't know. And yeah. Amanda, do you see what Amanda wrote? Amanda's right. 
Yeah, yeah, um, she says, we are all here to support our loved one. Puzzle pieces, infinity signs, blue or colorful. We are all just bringing awareness, acceptance, and action. That's beautiful. That's right. And it doesn't, it's just like what you call Autism Awareness Month. If you want to call it Autism Acceptance Month, the NCSA calls it Autism Action Month. What you're doing is you're, you're bringing awareness. You're trying to make the world a better place for the population. And you can do that if you choose to do the puzzle piece, the infinity, the blue, the colorful, or nothing at all. You yeah. know, it, as long as you are, um, you know, and, and maybe not even bringing awareness, but just um, being aware of the awareness and accepting others like we were talking about, that's really what matters. Absolutely. You know, the, the symbols and, and words and, and, and things like that, they, I, I understand how there's an emotion behind them, but, but to me, they're kind of on the surface. And I say that as one of the people who, who did the puzzle piece. What's, what's, what matters is what's underneath it. And the, the, the more um, salient things like, like understanding those differences and, and, and being okay with the differences and, and seeing that, that just because there may be differences in someone that doesn't necessarily mean that they're a bad person or that they're unworthy it's just that they're a little different and that's okay to me that's the important part of all of this yeah so let me we're out of time but i'm going to keep you a couple of minutes longer if it's okay i i want to ask you about a couple of different terms and just have you tell us how you not the entire community but how you feel about them how uh, do you, you you want to know how Thomas feels. I want to know how Thomas feels. Yeah. How do you feel about uh, the word neurodiverse and neurodiversity? I think the term has been hijacked to some extent, um, but I have been told by enough people that I have respect for that um, that the word is, is still valid. And um, I... I think I'm okay with it. I mean, I understand what it means. And I, I think that there is such a thing as neurodiversity. I think it would be a little nuts to say that, that it doesn't exist because it obviously does. And um, I, how do you mean, am I okay with it? What do you, what do you, can you give me a context well, there? I mean, here's the thing that, that I try to listen and I, um, and I try to adapt because the last thing, when I wake up in the morning, the last thing that I want to do is ever offend anybody or hurt their sense of identity. And, and the next phrase that I was going to ask you about is self-advocate because I've been using that term for years um, that I thought was a respectful uh, way of, of referring to somebody <clears throat> and say that, you know, so-and-so is a, is a self-advocate. I thought that that was a term of respect. And then someone that I respect and listen to posted the other day on Facebook and said that it's ableist to call someone a self-advocate. Uh, okay, well, I, I thought, talk, oh I, no. I, I could talk a little bit about, I just got a little thing pop up on my computer saying the battery level of this is okay. critical. So it may All go right. out and switch to the other microphone if that happens. Yeah, okay. But to answer that question, I personally have never really liked that term. I understand okay. it and I know where they're coming from. But in my mind, Thomas is not and has never been a self-advocate. He is an advocate. And that's a, that work is something that I am proud of doing. The advocacy that I've done, the difference I've made is something that I am proud of. I, I don't see myself as a, as a self-advocate, although I know I am. To me, it's not. It's not that. To me, it's not that Thomas has autism. To me, it's Thomas was able to do this for these people. And maybe those those two. I guess they do go together because one could not have happened without the other. But I I've never personally. I I don't think it's ableist. Let me say that before this goes out. I absolutely do not think the term self advocate is ableist. Um, 
I don't think uh, I don't think the puzzle piece is ableist. These things that people are saying are ableist, I don't think they are. But and I don't have a problem with other people using the term self advocate, and I never really said anything when people have used it in reference to me because it hasn't bothered me that much. It's just something that I've never considered myself to be. Well, Thomas, we are that that alarm is that we're officially out of time. We have to get off. But see, we're just going to have to have you back on a regular basis because there's so well, much. To- I'd be happy to come back. There we go. Uh, we didn't even talk about your books. Traven's got them. They're ready to put up on the screen. Uh, tell us a little bit about these two books and where we can get them. Uh, one of them, the of the second one, Light on the Horizon. It's not out of print. It is on hiatus, I understand, but that might as well be the same thing. I don't see it coming back soon. Um, and I'm okay with that because I'm not really happy with it. The other one, Soon Will Come to Light, Literary Achievement Award, uh, got me on Oprah. Um, definitely changed perception of autism back when it was released in 94. That one I, I am happy about and proud of. And it's still available um, on Amazon and I think from Future Horizons. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's so a that's biography. the one you would like for us to read. Is Soon yeah, well, Come to Light. You might be able to find the other one. It'll be difficult. Soon Will Come to Light is uh, kind of a biography. I've had, a, I've had an amazing life, even more so since it was published. But, you know, there's a, there's some, there's, uh, this is who Thomas is. And then, and there's also a lot about, you know, my personal take, not speaking for others, because we've talked about that, just Thomas's take on, on what autism is and where uh, these symptoms and behaviors and things are coming from and what you can do about it. And um, things like that are all in there. And I follow you on Facebook, Thomas, because I just, it's almost like my daily devotional that I read what, whatever it is you're writing about and it uplifts me. So, uh, but where do we, does everybody, everybody should follow you on Facebook or where can they find you? Uh, well, last time around, someone put up a little Facebook link on the screen. Um, you can follow me there or my own site. Um, th- th- what is your, do you, you mean you have a website? Because I don't know about I'm that. If you're right. It would be, you see that? I, we, I do remember this last time. I'm pointed right there. I think I'm pointing right to it. And, uh, Thomas and Trayvon's McKean, working on it. One, so say yeah, say it again. Word, ThomasAMcKean.com, all one word without the period that you see in my name there. Okay. So ThomasAMcKean.com. Um, right, one more quick thing before I go. Um, I also wanted to mention, and I thought of this because it wasn't yesterday you posted about Doreen's birthday. Yes. Yes. Yes, I thank you. Yeah, there it is. Um, I wanted to mention, um, that made me think of something. I said, I have to tell, I have to tell Shannon this on the podcast tomorrow. Um, a lot of the stuff that is happening out there in the autism community is happening because people are angry. And I get that. I know anger. I know rage. Ask Doreen. She has seen it from me. Mm-hmm. But um, but what I, what I finally figured out, and what I was angry about specifically, she'll tell you this too, I was angry about people who claim to, to, to practice and follow and believe in a doctrine of love who were doing horrible, horrible things to other people. I was angry about that. I was angry about man's inhumanity to man and the cruelty that I was seeing coming from people who profess to love their neighbor. That was making me angry. But but I I didn't like what that anger was doing to me. I didn't like the person that it was making me. And what I realized is that my anger is not going to change that. It's not going to change them. And the, the only thing that I could do about it was to be kind myself. And so I kind of tried to shift gears into kindness a little bit. I'm still kind of working on that. I'm trying to figure out still what 
kindness is. You know, you've been reading the post, so I think I've I've been getting better at that. And there's like thousands, thousands of people have been flocking to that page since I yeah. kind of shifted. And um, you know, the, the, I think I, the the way you change things is not by anger and it's not by rage. The way you change the world is through kindness and yeah. through 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 being being kind and and loving each other, even the people that you don't agree with, which can be a very difficult thing to do. And I can do that to some extent, but some people still making me angry enough. I'm not quite there yet, but I'm working yeah. on it. And, but to um, clarify, Thomas, it, uh, I'm yeah. assuming it was not Dr. Grand Pichet that you were angry at or that you no, think was no. cruel. Okay. Yes, I will clarify. It was not <laughs> her. Be clear that it wasn't. Because I know she has love for you. And I, I think that, you know, you were saying happy birthday. We want to be clear. Well, well, she was not the person you thought. I What's didn't that? know that. I didn't know that she felt that way about me. Uh, hello. Yes, but, she was so but, excited but, when we were I'm having you on before. She was yeah, so, so, so what I'm saying is I, she has seen that from me and and I've I'm try I've gotten over the anger and I am trying to figure out figure out what kindness is and how to be kind. Obviously I had some idea because I couldn't have done the things that I did if I didn't know. But I'm trying at this point in my life to put more of a focus on on, on kindness and being good to others, because I really think that's the way you make a difference. Amen. Amen. And, and Farrell says amen as well. Thomas is always delightful. And we have, you know, uh, we'll, we'll have you back. Maybe, you know, maybe we can find a time once a month where you can come and just share Thomasisms. I, I, I would do that. I, I would come back. There we go. Look, look, I even got an amen. Oh, look, and Amanda gave me a thank you. How could I yes. not? Come and Florine that? gave a thank you. So yes. you're touching uh, lives. You so Florine. Uh, and then this show will then be available as podcast and have even a much bigger audience. So you'll touch all of those lives. So Thomas, thank you so much. Uh, we encourage people to follow you and and to read uh you know, one or both of those books. Uh, and you guys can go to Future Horizons. Uh, I, I love me some Future Horizons. Future Horizons is publishing my book that's coming out in July. So you, it's like oh, one stop. It. How about yeah. that? So yes. you guys can go to Future oh, Horizons. Sure. Soon Will Come the Light was their first. My book How launched a little publishing empire. Well, now, yes, now there is a publishing empire, and I think it's where all the best autism books are. I, so. I had no idea that would happen. I'm so proud of them. I'm so proud of them for what they've done. Well, look where you they've started. Just, they've just become huge. I know. And it's kind of amazing, all the different things. We're, we're featuring a bunch of different Future Horizon authors uh, the next couple of months. So you guys can check them out here. But Thomas, thank you so much for taking the time and for uh, asking, uh, answering all the questions that people wrote in. Thank you to all of you for asking the questions. Don't forget tomorrow. Oh, this week, you guys, tomorrow we have Dr. Doreen Grampiche is going to be with us. And then on Wednesday, guess who's going to be with us on Wednesday, Thomas? I would imagine my first guest would be my friend Temple. No, she's on next Monday. So she'll oh, really? be on, well, who's on Wednesday. It's her mom. Eustacia Cutler is on on Wednesday. Oh, I've met her. Nice lady. Isn't she uh, so that will be on Wednesday. If you've ever wondered about, uh, as she was on the show once before, if you've ever wondered about Temple Grandin's mom, you don't have to anymore. She's going to be with us on Wednesday. So that's how the week is shaping up. I got to sign off now or Traven's going to get the hook. But thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Thomas. We'll be back tomorrow with Dr. Doreen for Ask Dr. Doreen. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you next time.